Hello and good morning. I am Abad Heather and you are watching Can Can La. So our company in focus today is a company that has dominated the gaming industry across the globe. And if you're into Baccarat and Blackjack, it might not have your, touched your heart, but it has definitely touched your wallet. So I'm talking about the Las Vegas Sands company. And we'll take you straight to our correspondent Alex Gilbert, who is outside the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. So Alex, how's Singapore? It's hot, especially in this studio jacket. Sounds great. So, all over to you now. Thank you, Ibad. This is Alex Gilbert for Can Can La TV, reporting to you live in front of the glorious Marina Bay Sands Hotel and Resort. So who exactly is Sands, and what exactly do they do? Las Vegas Sands is a U.S.-based multinational company. It's a global developer and operator of integrated resorts around the world. These resorts include luxury hotels, gambling, entertainment, retail, business convention, and restaurants. Las Vegas Sands traces its roots back to the 1952 original Sands Vegas, famous for hosting Frank Sinatra and its mafia connections. Sheldon Adelson, the CEO, purchased the building in 1989, constructing the Sands Expo and Convention Center across the street, and establishing its business model of hosting business conventions during the traditionally slow midweek period and catering to tourists over the weekend. In 1996, they tore down the Sands Vegas and constructed the Venetian, a $1.5 billion, 4,000 room Vegas landmark, completed in 1999. In the early 2000s, China granted Macau special gambling licenses, of which Las Vegas Sands secured a sub-license. Sheldon Adelson stated, more than one billion people live within a three-hour flight to Macau, and more than three billion people live within a five-hour flight. They constructed the Sands Macau in 2004 at a cost of 240 million, and earning its investment back in less than one year. The company decided to reclaim land in Macau to build a new casino strip to rival that in Vegas. In 2007, they finished the construction of the Venetian Macau, which is the largest casino in the world, twice the size of its Vegas counterpart, the sixth largest building in the world by floor area, and able to accommodate 90 Boeing 747 jets. They can accommodate up to 100,000 guests every single day. Las Vegas Sands continued to expand its Vegas and Macau operations with the construction of the Palazzo in Vegas in 2008 and the Four Seasons Macau in 2010. 2010 also saw the completion of the Marina Bay Sands behind me. It is said to be one of the most expensive standalone structures in the world with an estimated cost of over $6 billion. This resort alone features 2,500 hotel rooms, a 1.3 million square foot convention center, an 800,000 square foot mall, a museum, two large theaters, seven celebrity chef restaurants, an ice skating rink, and the world's largest atrium casino with 500 tables and 1,600 slot machines. The complex is topped by the 340 meter long sky park with a capacity of almost 4,000 people and the world's most iconic infinity swimming pool. Las Vegas Sands continues to invest in Asia with the recent 2012 opening of the Sands Kotai Central in Macau, a $4 billion, 6,000 hotel room investment. It's a $43 billion market cap company with more than $11 billion in 2012 revenue and gross profit of $5 billion. Which operating segments generate all this money? About 80% comes from gaming revenues, 10% from hotel rooms, and the remaining 10% split between dining, business conventions, and retail shop leases. Geographically, Las Vegas Sands derives more than half of its earnings from Macau, one-third from Singapore, and the remainder from the U.S. Back to you, Ibad. Thank you, Alex, for that report. And we would now take you to our correspondent, Emma Tarek, who is with Mr. Sheldon Adelson, CEO of Las Vegas Sands. Over to you, Emma. Thanks, Ibad, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Marina Bay Sands, where the wealthy people hang out and play casino. Here I introduce you the casino CEO, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. It's an honor to see you, sir. Thank you, Ahmed. It's great to be here with you in Can Singapore. Can you start the interview? 
Sure, I think we'll go ahead if you guys are ready. Yeah. Sir, with so much success in Singapore and Macau, what really is your competitive advantage? Well, it really boils down to three success factors. With the first one is the timing and the first mover advantage that we capture. So, for example, in Macau, as you know, we were the first ones to be granted a casino license. So we were the first casino established in Macau. We came in pretty big time. We cut, caught a critical mass and larger market share, and we were very successful in doing that. And it's kind of the same here in Singapore. As you can see, it's a very large casino. We were one of the first in the market, and uh, we were able to get a large critical mass pretty early uh, in the casino business, which was pretty new or totally new here in Singapore. And then the, uh, the second factor is the mass market gaming focus that we have. So we actually try to cater to uh, a large group of uh, focus clients, so families, the VIP gamblers, um, convention goers and gamers. So we try to capture a very extensive uh, slice of the crowd and not just the casino gamblers. And then thirdly, uh, I think we also always make large scale investments. So when we go into new markets, we go in big time. You could say probably in poker terms, we go all in. Whoa, now that sounds like a real poker game right now. So now my next question is that after Macau in Singapore, what is next for Sands? Looking of course uh, in the future at the Asian affluent markets and rolling out these very large standalone uh, integrated casino resorts as the Singapore Resort here in the background. Looking at the countries uh, that don't have any casino, established casinos yet that are ready to open their markets, I think uh, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, probably Thailand would be some of the next markets in the Asian region. Okay, right. so okay, sir, so what is basically the focus of your expansion outside Asia? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we've been looking for Europe for a long time and we just decided this year that we're going to roll out our ne next huge casino project in Madrid in Spain. Wow. And as usual, I think we're going to go all in as we did with Singapore and Macau. Okay, thank you so much, sir, and we look forward to talking to you again once more. Thanks thank you. A lot. It was a pleasure. So, guys, you got to know about Las Vegas uh, Corporation and its CEO. Now, uh, thanks a lot. And now it's back to the studios. to Ibad. Do you want to go gamble? Want to go gamble? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Let's get it, dude. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Throw a party. I'm trying to speak louder as well. Oh. There we had, ladies and gentlemen, our very own Mr. Ahmed Tariq, who was with Mr. Sheldon Adelson. And now we have with us a personality whose work has impacted every business student's life. I'm talking about the king of strategy, Mr. Michael Porto. And to speak to him, we have our correspondent, Tala. Over to you, Tala. Thank you, Ibad. We are joined here by Michael Porter. Let's seek his opinion on Las Vegas Sands through the lens of his Porter's Five Forces model. Hello, Mr. Porter. Hello, nice to meet you. Pleasure. We are seeing the rise of smart customers across the world with the advent of technology. How do you think this is impacting the consumer buying power for Las Vegas Sands? And how is it impacting the strategy of Las Vegas Sands? So I will look at that through uh, different geographies and the different businesses that Las Vegas and is in. So if you look at Las Vegas and Macau, where there are a lot of other competing casinos, I would say that casino goers or basically uh, consumers have a higher buying power. But if you look at Singapore, where basically there is only one other casino, which is the Jenning Group, I would say that the casino goers here have a lower buying power. Okay. How about the supplier power? Because we see that this this business is highly regulated, right? And across the region, what we are observing is that governments do have a significant stake. What is your opinion on the supplier powers and how do they influence the strategy of Las Vegas? That's correct. So I would say that if you look at government as supplier of uh, operating licenses and land concession, they definitely have very high supplier power. For example, in Singapore, there is only two operating licenses available and the government has very high power here. Uh, that is also the similar case for Macau, where there are only six operating licenses issued. What is your opinion on the threat of substitutes there? Because we are seeing the, with the emergence of internet, there has been uh, a rise in online gaming. Do you think this is impacting casino business? And if that is the case, in which markets is going to, is, it, is this going to have the largest? So definitely, online gambling has been a recent trend, and uh, it could potentially affect Las Vegas Sands' future revenue. But I personally don't think there is a high threat 
muscle skills on this area. What do you think is the threat of new entrants in this business? And how do you think that new entrants are going to impact casino strategy uh, in, in these localities in which Las Vegas stands? Well? So if you look at the casino business, I would say that there is very little threat for new entrants. Firstly, because it's a very regulated industry, government holds a lot of power, and basically there's a very high uh, fixed investments required. So these are very high uh, barriers to entry. But if you look at the other business for hotels, retail malls, or otherwise convention center, I would say that there is a higher threat of new entrants because these are basically not regulated. What is your final thought on the threat of rivalry for Las Vegas students? So if you look on this issue at a global scale, some of uh, Las Vegas students being compared to the MGM, Citizens Entertainment, Genting Group, the one and otherwise the main group. Um, so in Las Vegas and Macau, there's definitely a higher uh, level of competition because there is a lot of state players. Correct. But in Singapore, it's a different case because the there are only two operating licenses issued and thus totally unprepared to be the gen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Porter. Over to you, Ivan. Okay. So, there we had Mr. Tala with Mr. Michael Porter and their analysis on the LVSS industry. We now have with us in our studio Mr. Alan Harper, who is an expert on the gaming industry. Welcome and thank you for joining us in this studio. You're welcome. So you've been following the gaming industry for quite some time. So what do you, what are your opinion on Mr. Adelson's plan for future growth in Macau? Being the first global conglomerate in Macau uh, has certainly worked beautifully for LVS. Macau's mass gaming market is set to grow because of the increasing middle class in China. If LVS continue to maintain its current MICE business model and continue to target the mass gaming market, it should do very well with further expansions. Having good relationships with the local government is also a very important factor in the Macau market. Right, so we know that LVS plans to enter the European market, particularly in Spain. So what risk factors do you perceive are related to this particular strategy? Uh, LVS is entering Europe in a big way. Uh, Europe is a relatively untapped and large market, and LVS is going to enjoy the first mover advantage in this market. So, what are the factors do you see are pertinent to LVS's future growth plans? LVS is certainly the leader in this industry right now, and is well positioned to grow further. However, uh, it is taking huge steps to fund its growth and any significant reduction in demand would significantly reduce its ability to make its payments and threaten its solvency. Uh, LVS nearly went bankrupt because of this in the recent Great Recession. Also, the online gaming uh, industry, if it becomes formally legalized, can pose a considerable threat to LVS. This would allow non casino players or smaller casino players to enter the market and they may evolve into considerable threats in the future. Well, we'll have to see what the future holds for Elvis. Thank you for joining us here in the studio. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of our report. On behalf of all of us here in CanCan Live Studio, we wish you a great day ahead and good luck. Threat of new entrance. <laughs> That's gonna come up. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. And will be the number one casino in Europe. Okay, okay. Wow. And more than five billion. Oh shit. Ah, oh, I fucked it up. That's okay. Oh man. I feel fat. Is it recording? <laughs> Is it recording? <laughs> <laughs>